Elvis Presley. The mere mention of his name conjures up a thousand images. His explosive impact on music and our culture changed the course of entertainment history. His rags to riches story from poor country boy to king of rock and roll is a stuff of American legend. But for all the attention Elvis has gotten over the years, it seems the real Elvis has somehow gotten lost. Just who was the real Elvis Presley and what was he actually like behind closed doors? Of all the people who claim to have known Elvis intimately, less than a handful were true insiders. And of those who came and went throughout Elvis's life, there was one very special, very loyal friend at Elvis's side for nearly 20 years. Joe Esposito, the highest ranking member of Elvis's inner circle. And he said, why don't you go to work for me? And I said, yeah, I would love that. And basically I was very excited. I, mean, I couldn't believe that I was gonna go to work for Elvis Presley. Two weeks later, I went down to Memphis and uh, it all started there. From army buddy to accountant, bodyguard to bookkeeper, Joe was a best man at Elvis's wedding and his road manager and close friend. Together for over 6,000 live performances and 26 feature films. Diamond Joe, as Elvis affectionately called him, was there for it all. And what a wonderful ride it was. Welcome to Elvis, his best friend remembers. A video scrapbook. Featuring over 500 rare photographs from the private collection of Joe Esposito, along with film clips, newsreels, and candid interviews with the people who knew Elvis best. Joe takes us behind the scenes for an intimate and revealing look at what life with Elvis was really like. On the road, on stage and off, out on the town, and behind the scenes. I remember when I got drafted, uh, there was rumors going around that Elvis was gonna be drafted about the same time. And uh, you know, the excitement was the buzz around. Nobody thought he would ever go in the army because of being a big celebrity. They figured they wouldn't draft Elvis. I go into service, I go to Fort Hood, Texas, and then Elvis is drafted and he comes to Fort Hood, Texas. Now, Fort Hood, Texas is a big, big base. I, never, I didn't get a chance to meet him there, but I'd see him around base once in a while. And I never walked up to him. There was about 20,000 guys on the base at the time. We went all through basic training together. Not physically together, I mean, but I'd see him around base. It was exciting to realize, here I am with this guy we all talked about in the neighborhood. Being at Fort of Texas, our uh, armored division decided to transfer to Germany. And those rumors Elvis was coming there too. So I go to Germany. When I got there, I heard in the paper that Elvis's mother died. Uh, she died while he was in the service. So he was delayed as far as coming to Germany. So I go to Germany, it's a little small base uh, in Friedberg, Germany there, and I'm working in an office. I got a real nice, comfortable job in the service. I was a finance clerk. I'm in the office with a good friend of mine, and I hear all this commotion outside by the, by the gate of the base. I asked George, my friend George, what's going on? Do you have an idea? He says, well, I was told Elvis is coming, to the, coming here tonight. He's going to be stationed here with us. I said, that's great. So we sort of looked out the window. We couldn't see anything. There was thousands of kids screaming and yelling out there, all these buses pulling in, all these GIs looking the same all in the same uniforms, they couldn't see him. The base, uh, Ray Barracks it was called, uh, was just typical Army base, 3,000 men, uh, three outfits, the artillery, 27th artillery, which I was in, and Elvis was in 32nd Armored Division, which was tanks. Germany was strange for Elvis. He'd never been to a foreign country before, uh, except for Canada, but that wasn't foreign. It was cold, uh, snow, and the language. Elvis was very nervous about going over there. He didn't know how he'd be accepted. He did, uh, end up running a house over there in Bad Nauheim, which was about 15 kilometers from Friedberg, where we were stationed. Running this house on a nice big house on 14 Gertherstrasse. I'll never forget that address. This house was the house that Elvis met Priscilla in. It was great. It was very warm. His uh, father uh, and his grandmother came there. His grandmother would cook uh, breakfast and dinner for him. He wasn't too thrilled with the food in Germany. Uh, that was a very basic uh, southern boy. He had to have his uh, mashed potatoes and gravy and his eggs fried the way he wanted them and his bacon and he wasn't much of a Venus Nissel guy. Elvis's tour of duty in the army was actually very good for him. Uh, he didn't think it would be because he was concerned that he wouldn't be as popular when he got out. But he was on every magazine cover you could think of uh, during those two years. And then the parents uh, of the teenagers that were in love with Elvis we're starting to respect him. He went to the service just like anybody else would. He served his time. Uh, and when he got out, he was more popular than ever. Our tour of duty was coming to an end in Germany. 
uh, I got my departure papers to leave in the end of February, and Elvis, uh, I knew he was leaving right after me. So one evening uh, at the house, he, we took a ride in the car. He said, let's go for a ride. So we drove around the city a little bit, and he said, asked what I was going to do when I got out. And I said, well, I'm going to go back home and go back to my job. And he said, why don't you go to work for me? And I said, yeah, I would love that. And he said, okay. He says, uh, gave me the phone number at the house. He says, when you get back home, you know, stay in touch with me. Give me a call. Let me know, and you can come down, and we'll start off. I got a lot of work to do when, we get, when I get back home. And, and basically, I was very excited. I mean, I couldn't believe that I was going to go to work for Elvis Presley. Two weeks later, I went down to Memphis, and uh, it all started there. Well, when Elvis got out of the Army, the press was everywhere. As you remember on television, they showed him landing in the snowstorm and, uh, near Fort Dix, New Jersey. He had a big welcoming committee. Uh, Nancy Sinatra was there to welcome him back for her father that was throwing the big uh, welcome home TV show down in Miami for Elvis. It was just back the way it was before he left, two years before that. I mean, uh, they were there, but he was excited to see him back, and the press was going crazy. I was in tanks for a long time, you see. And uh, they rock and roll quite a bit. <laughs> he was thrilled to be back in Memphis, and uh, you could just see it in his face. He was excited, but yet he was, you know, it was not the same because his mother was gone. Uh, his mother passed away while I was in the service, and it was not the same. So he threw a, a, had a press conference in his office in the back of Graceland. He was very relaxed. You could see it on the film that he was very relaxed, and he was, he was glad to be home. And here's some of that press conference right now. I had quite a few interesting experiences. Slip out in the snow. <laughs> HC rations, you know, all the regular thing. But uh, I suppose the, the biggest thing of all is the fact that I, I did make it. I made it just like everybody, I mean, I tried to play it straight, you know, like everybody else. And uh, I made a lot of friends that I never would have made otherwise. And uh, all in all, it's been a pretty good experience, you know. Well, basic training wasn't hard for me at all. Uh, it was harder afterwards, after I had gotten into a, a regular outfit. Uh, not the service itself, but just the surroundings, and I was in a strange land, and uh, uh, the outfit I was in, they had quite a bit of field duty. We stayed in the field six months out of the year. And it gets cold in Germany, and <laughs> it snows quite a bit. And uh, uh, it was pretty hard to adjust to. Well, the only thing I could say is to, uh, to play it straight and, and, and to do your best, because you can't fight them. <laughs> they've never they've never lost yet you know? <laughs> and you can't fight them so uh, you can make it easier you can make it hard on yourself i mean if you play it straight get the people on your side let them know you're trying you you as the arm would say you've got it made and if you're going to try to be an individual or try to be different you're going to go through two years of misery <laughs> My first actual show business gig, as I would say, is uh, going to Miami Beach to do the Frank Sinatra special for Elvis Presley. Went up and had a top suite, this huge suite up there overlooking the ocean, and this next tower one over was Sinatra's suite on the other end with all the other stars over there. You couldn't see them from us, but I was thinking to myself, I'm on the patio looking at Miami Beach, beautiful weather, and I said, it was like an awe. I was saying, I am here with Elvis, Frank Sinatra, two of the biggest stars in the world, and my whole life has changed because I got drafted in the Army. Thank you, Mr. Presley. Well, would you think it presumptuous of uh, uh, Frank uh, if he joined you in a duet? Well, yeah, that would be I, very, I would, yeah. uh, I would consider it quite an honor. I'd like to do one of your songs. All right. Uh, I mean, you know, with you. Well, fine, fine. You know, I was wondering, as a matter of fact, while you were singing Elvis, I thought to myself, I wonder what would have happened if I had recorded uh, Love Me Tender instead of you. I wouldn't have made any difference. I think it would, about uh, two million records less. <laughs> he should have. You smarty pants. Oh, oh and I thought we'd do, we do a, we'll do a, uh, uh, you do witchcraft, okay? And I'll do one of the other ones. Okay, <laughs> Nelson? Nelson? Well, I remember when Elvis came on the scene in the early 50s, uh, I was in Chicago, nothing exciting. Music was just passe. I mean, the, I remember the hit parade was on TV in those days, just uh, nice, easygoing music. And all of a sudden, I hear rumors about this young guy uh, 
uh, exciting music, uh, completely different. I first saw Elvis Presley in, in the late 50s on TV, and I was really uh, in awe. I didn't know what I was looking at, really. This young man doing all these moves and singing rock and roll now, as it is today, was amazing to me. At that time, I was a big fan of Frank Sinatra, uh, Dean Martin. Uh, that's the kind of music we were listening to in those days. But then Elvis came along. He was amazing. This guy on stage shaking his legs, uh, girls going crazy watching him. It was strange for me to see that, but then as we listened to his music, I really started to appreciate him more and more. In fact, uh, many of the discussions with the guys I used to hang out with in Chicago, I was defending this guy because everybody was putting him down, the press and everyone. As the more I listened to his songs, the more I liked him. And then uh, I saw him on television about three different times, and he really impressed me as a, a good young entertainer. I just uh, started buying his records and I enjoyed listening to him. And then the girls around, naturally, they were all going crazy over him. The friends of, of mine and their boyfriends were very, very upset because, you know, at that time, uh, uh, we were very possessive of our women. All those guys were very jealous of Elvis because he had such great impact on all these women screaming and yelling. And at that time, the girls would never do that. And here they are, this good-looking guy. We were all very jealous of him. It was exciting. At the time, Elvis came along. You know, he was perceived to be a very sexy human being to all the women, and uh, the press did not like that. The reaction of the older establishment, and the, they just didn't know what he was. They thought it was vulgar. They thought his moves were sexual, and uh, that upset them tremendously, and the press started tearing him apart, and the, the churches were saying, he's got the devil in him. Kids didn't see it that way. They just thought this was something new and something exciting. They couldn't understand why this guy was singing and shaking, but Elvis was being himself. People didn't realize that till now. And uh, now he's he's like an angel on stage if you look at him compared to what's going on today. Elvis's fan reaction was always tremendous, as you will see in this very rare news footage. Elvis Presley. The appeal of a Presley may escape the older generation, but his devoted fans regard him as an eminently attractive and admirable figure of a man, a worthy successor to a Clark Gable. Cary Grant. Local boy makes good. Elvis the Pelvis Presley, king of rock and roll, returns to Tupelo, Mississippi. Advanced sales of his new disc top the million, a record of the record business. The local girls went crazy. One leapt on the stage and the cops had to stop her from jumping on his blue suede shoes. They just love him to death. But perhaps Elvis has had too much rough adoration. For instance, his first picture is called Love Me Tender. I remember when Elvis' uh, third movie came out. It was Jailhouse Rock, and it was a little different. Elvis was this tough guy, and he goes to jail. People really enjoyed it, and I think they started appreciating his acting a little more. The reaction was getting big in England and Germany, and I think that movie really uh, rocketed him to stardom around the world. In Jailhouse Rock, there's the one scene by the swimming pool. Elvis sings this number, and he is so good-looking and sexy, and I think that's what did it. I mean, that's where the press even started appreciating him, and the, the young people around the world really loved him. I realized all the publicity stills were taken from Jailhouse Rock, and that was the one that really rocketed him to stardom. And as we see so many stills, and uh, we see so many of them today, that's probably one of the biggest publicity campaigns they ever did on a movie. In Jailhouse Rock, there were so many beautiful girls in that picture. And I really think that's where they decided to make a lot of the movies with Elvis and a lot of gorgeous women. And from that time on, from that, all the movies had beautiful women in them, and he was always involved with them. The dance sequence in Jailhouse Rock Elvis was really involved with the famous dance number, with all the inmates. Elvis went to the choreographer and gave him several suggestions as to how the dance sequence might be played. And Elvis's ideas were right on, as all his ideas ended up on screen. This was the movie that really catapulted him into the stratosphere as an international movie star. Just before Jailhouse Rock was going to be released to the theaters, Colonel Parker put Elvis on a road tour. And uh, one of the stops was in Tupelo, Mississippi, Elvis wanted to do a charity event there to raise money for the Elvis Presley Youth Project. It was a charity organization he started to 
help out the youth of Tupelo. And you can see how relaxed Elvis was. He had a lot of fun backstage. This is, just shows Elvis in a different light. I'd never seen this before, and it's a great piece of footage. Yeah, Elvis was always in control with it, whatever he did. This piece of footage has been seen over and over again, but it's such a great piece of way Elvis moves on stage. And he's so relaxed. The audience you could see is just overwhelmed at him, and he gets his energy from his fans, and the fans are going crazy, so Elvis was going crazy. This is a shot of Gladys and Vernon in the audience, and sitting next to Gladys is Mrs. Parker, uh, Colonel Parker's wife. When Elvis sang, he, he, he sang with his heart and his body, and uh, he's been asked this question as many times, why he did the moves he did do. He says, I can't help it. It just comes naturally out of me, and that's what I feel like doing at the time. After Elvis got out of the service, uh, he still kept on learning karate, he kept taking lessons from karate uh, from different instructors. And he really was actually probably one of the first guys to bring it into Hollywood before uh, Bruce Lee got real popular. He loved giving demonstrations to uh, different celebrities, Ricky Nelson, uh, different people, Ty Harden, friends that would come and visit Elvis. He'd be giving karate demonstrations all the time. He felt good about doing this because this is the only guy doing this and everybody was excited about it. I think he talked a lot of people into taking lessons. So all through the years, he always learned more, he always read about it, and he liked karate because it had a lot to do with inner strength and it's a very religious type form of art. And he talked to friends about it all the time and, and it gave him a lot of confidence. Because remember when Elvis was young, guys were always trying to pick on him because he was always a strange kid. I think from this point on, he had a lot of confidence in himself that he could, he could defend himself real easy. And uh, he enjoyed it, and that, he lived all his life. He put it into his uh, onstage performances. You see a lot of the moves on stage. Elvis was doing karate kicks, uh, different moves. So his whole life, till he, till he passed away, was all karate. He really loved to um, uh, show people how it worked and how, how was the mental um, uh, ability of karate. And you're supposed to be, only use it for defense. You don't ever be aggressive with it. And uh, Elvis uh, became very good at it. Ellis made 31 feature films in his career, and uh, I was there for 26 of them. And uh, I, got a, I learned a lot about film production. It's, uh, it's a lot harder than people realize. I mean, they think it's all exciting and uh, everybody's having a big party, but they don't realize half time you're sitting around waiting for the next setup shot. You know, you shoot two minutes of film in a whole day. In the movie Blue Hawaii, Elvis was being a tour guide, so he was showing these students around Hawaii. Nice shot of Elvis and Darlene Thompson, one of the co-stars in the movie. This one in Blue Hawaii was a lot of fun. Elvis and Joan Blackman made two movies together. A nice sexy shot, both of them in their bathing suits. Elvis made three movies in Hawaii. This is a couple of shots in the movie Girls, Girls, Girls. In the movie, Elvis plays a helicopter pilot. Once again, he gets all the girls, girls, girls. It was exciting just being around Elvis films. They were up movies, they were fun movies to make. I was in a few of Elvis' pictures. He was good about that, you know, hey, why don't you use Joe, why don't you use Red, why don't you use Sonny, any of the guys in the pictures, and uh, they would use us. We were on location up in Napa, California for the movie Wow in the Country, and while we were there, Colonel Parker wanted to give an autograph session to all the fans and the people of the town. So here we are at the motel, and Elvis is signing pictures for everybody came to the doorway. Look at the great look on Elvis's face. This is on location to follow that dream down in Florida. Elvis and Red West working out, giving a little karate demonstration to the cast and the crew. Very hot on location. Elvis is in the shade, resting and relaxing between shots. This is a scene from the movie where Elvis is getting ready to drive away. Here's Elvis pretending he's a gangster with a phony Thompson submachine gun. It's a prop, it's not real. Elvis was very good to his fans. He would take a break and go talk to them between takes. This young lady here was the watermelon queen of that county, and she's presenting Elvis with a watermelon. No matter what happened, Elvis always took time out for his fans. Here he's shaking hand with a couple of young kids. Elvis's first movie was a western for 20th Century Fox. It was Love Me Tender. His character name was Clint Reno. This is a scene from the movie Jailhouse Rock. 
And if you look closely, all the guys in the background, all his buddies from Memphis. This is the movie Harem Scarum, a Sam Katzman production, a very low budget picture. And Elvis played a sheik in the movie, and his co-star was Marianne Mobley. She did two movies with Elvis. She used to be uh, Miss America from Mississippi. Very nicely, they got along great together. Elvis liked doing this movie, believe it or not. He liked the character of the sheik, the dark tan and the, the turban. Uh, he thought he was Rudolph Valentino. It happened at the World's Fair. It was shot in 1962 up in Seattle. We shot it during the World's Fair at the time, and there was people everywhere. It was really tough shooting the, the movie because we had to go back and forth between the dressing room and the sets and different places around the World's Fair. So there was thousands of people everywhere we went. And periodically, Elvis would stop and sign autographs and talk to the fans. We had to keep moving quite a bit because we couldn't stop. We would bog down the whole place. It was a lot of fun, and you notice a lot of the guys wearing black uh, jumpsuits and sunglasses. We were like the secret service for Elvis, and he wanted it that way so he could see us in the crowd. During filming of a lot of the movies, we'd all hang around, just talk, a lot of times play cards. But during the World's Fair here, we're sitting down and kidding around, joking, and Gary Lockwood, the co-star of the movie, he joined us. He became like one of our buddies on the whole movie. And it was fun. Sometimes we'd play football if we were on location outdoors. Uh, we'd play cards, tell jokes, just being a bunch of young guys having a good time. I got my first part in the movie, in The World's Fair. It was uh, very nervous for me because I'm not an actor, but the director, Norman Turok, decided to use me in this one scene. And all my family and friends in Chicago were so thrilled to see me on camera. One of Elvis's favorite co-stars was Anne Margaret from Viva Las Vegas. Elvis's co-star in Speedway was Nancy Sinatra. She was a good friend of Elvis's. The Trouble with Girls was a fun shoot. Marilyn Mason, as Elvis's co-star, was a lot of fun. She used to crack jokes and she'd fool around and she was a lot of fun to work with. Elvis had a great time with her. In the movie The Trouble with Girls, Elvis had a football scene. He loved to play touch football in his own time. And as you could tell in the scene, he really had a great time. He's got a big smile on his face and he's running for a touchdown. the movie Stay Away Joe in Sedona, Arizona, a real beautiful place. Uh, Elvis decided to have Priscilla and my wife Joan came with her and Colonel Park was there. They came visiting on the set. It was such a beautiful area. We wanted them to see the area and not too often they came to visit us. So it was fun. We had a great time. I'd have a small part in Elvis's movies once in a while. This particular one was Stay Away Joe. I was repossessing Elvis's car in this scene. During the filming of Flaming Star in California, Elvis was doing a lot of karate and had me talking about his knuckles, how, how callous they were, and that's because he used to beat boards and hit bricks to make them tough. This is on the set of Flaming Star. I'm there talking to Jerry Schilling and Sonny West, good friends, they all worked with Elvis together. Elvis was great about having family and friends in his movies. In the movie Live a Little, Love a Little, he used his dad as a male model in this one scene. Elvis was a photographer and uh, we shot it down at the Los Angeles Music Center in downtown Los Angeles. Here we're on the beach in Malibu during the filming of uh, Live a Little, Love a Little. Elvis liked to smoke these uh, little thin cigars. I would rehearse his lines with him between takes and while he was getting made up. Elvis made a movie with, with Mary Tyler Moore. The movie was called Change of Habit. We shot at Universal Studios and uh, once in a while, Elvis and the guys, we'd all take off and go check out the back lot at Universal. Elvis's good friend, George Barris, the custom car king, built this Cadillac limousine. We were filming Spin Out when RCA executives came on the set and presented Elvis with two more gold albums. During a lot of the movies, Elvis would, uh, was very curious about how things worked on making movies, so he'd check out the camera shots once in a while, talk to the cameraman how things worked, and he was interested in learning all facets of the movie business. Elvis is posing for a picture here with Colonel Tom Parker as manager and Philip Dunn, the director of Wild in the Country. During the filming of the documentary, That's the Way It Is, Elvis gave his tandem bicycle to the English fan club president, and the man took it back to England and showed it to all the fans back there. Damn, Elvis was good looking.
Elvis was a very generous person, and uh, Colonel Parker was too. A lot of people don't realize that. Colonel read in the paper one time where the U.S. Potomac was President Roosevelt's boat at one time, and it was gonna be destroyed. It was gonna be scrap. Uh, it was just getting old, and they didn't know what to do with it. Colonel came up with an idea. He said, he went to Elvis and said, Elvis, let's buy this boat, since it's a piece of history. It will donate to somebody where they could charge admission for people to go on and look at it and get the money for charity. So Colonel went to the March of Dimes, which that was President Roosevelt. He started that charity organization, so he figured that's the best people to go to. He went to them, and they didn't want the boat. They didn't want the responsibility. They didn't know what to do with it. So Colonel ended up giving it to Danny Thomas for the St. Jude organization. We were in Vegas goofing around, having a good time, and the Colonel set it up where we were going to fly in, meet Danny Thomas at Long Beach. The boat was in Long Beach and uh, go there and do a big press conference and Elvis would give Danny Thomas the boat. The colonel, is a, he, he's a pretty smart guy. He looked at the boat, it was really beat up. It looked, didn't look too good, so he had somebody paint the whole one side of the boat, the one side where the dock where the press would be able to see it. He didn't paint the other side, he just painted the side where the, the press would see this beautiful, good-looking boat. And it was just so funny. And I thought to myself, well, he said, hey, I'm gonna give it to them. They could paint the other side. <laughs> I remember when we arrived in Long Beach, there was a lot, of, a lot of press, and a lot of fans were there. I guess they heard rumors that Elvis was going to be there. And all the press, and they were coming, Elvis, come on, Elvis, come over here and sit and talk to Danny Thomas. And Elvis said, just a minute. He stopped, and he signed autographs for all his fans. He would always stop and do that no matter what happened, because he always said if it wasn't for his fans, he wouldn't be here. And that's the truth. And every celebrity should think that way. And Elvis was like that. And so it didn't matter if Danny Thomas was waiting or, or the president could be waiting. He would sign autographs for his fans. Elvis had been dating Priscilla for a long time, and uh, I think she was turned 21, and he knew that it was time to get married. He was, he was in love with her, and they, Priscilla and Elvis talked about it for a long time. So Elvis one day called in uh, Marty Lacker and myself and told us that he wanted to get married. He talked to the colonel about it, and uh, he wanted the colonel to set it up, and that Marty and I were to work with the colonel to set up the arrangements for the wedding. And. Uh, but it was even more exciting that when Elvis asked us to be co-best men. I mean, that was a very big honor for me. I mean, uh, to realize I was going to be one of the best men at Elvis Presley's wedding. I mean, we were friends and employees second. It was great. I mean, I was only around for a few years, you know. And so we made arrangements. Colonel wanted to do it in Las Vegas. He figured that's the best place to go because you don't have to wait for a marriage license for any three days like you do in California. And the press wouldn't find out about it. So we started making arrangements. and. The best idea we had was to go to Palm Springs. The rumors are getting around now that Elvis was going to get married. I don't know, don't, I have no idea how those things happen in Hollywood, but started getting Rona Barrett heard about it, and a lot of the different press started her. So we all go to Palm Springs. We saw we fake them off. Go to Palm Springs, invite fa Elvis' family, the media, his father and his stepmother and the kids and all that come to Palm Springs and Priscilla's family. So we coordinated everything, so Elvis's family uh, and Priscilla's family all met in Palm Springs, the house there. We put them in different hotels. and The plan was, late in the evening, to sneak over to Vegas. Had a chartered plane for the family and friends, and then there was a Learjet that took Elvis, Priscilla, myself, my wife Joan, and George Klein. We went earlier, went off the back, back way of the house at Palm Springs, went out to, had a couple cars waiting for us, took us right to the airport, got on the Learjet, and flew right to Las Vegas and had a car waiting there. A colonel was a very good friend of Milton Prell, which owned the, the Ladin Hotel at the time. They picked us up, took us right downtown to the city hall in Las Vegas, went up there, got the marriage license, Priscilla and Elvis, and signed what we had to do, and I signed as a witness, and so did Marty as a witness on the marriage license. Went back to the hotel, and the rest of the family showed up. We started getting dressed and got our tuxedos on, and. Uh, so it was about, I think it was about 10 o'clock, 10.30 or something like that. We all go to Milton Prell's suite. That's where the wedding was set up. In Las Vegas, it's wedding bells for the man who practically invented rock and roll, Elvis Presley, and Priscilla Beaulieu, a friend of eight years standing. The 32-year-old Mississippi boy who started a new style of singing gives his bride a 20-carat diamond ring. 
Now more a movie than a recording star, Elvis met Priscilla when he was a GI in Germany, and she, the daughter of a lieutenant colonel, was a high school girl. It's the first marriage for both. When Priscilla walked into the room, she was so beautiful and stunning. I mean, it sort of took your breath away. She, uh, she was absolutely wonderful, and she was very, very nervous. You could see it, much more nervous than Elvis was. And Elvis uh, had a great smile on his face, and you could see how much they loved each other. And uh, it was uh, just a wonderful feeling to know there's two happy people here. During the ceremony, it was very intimate. There was only a few people in there. It was very small. Uh, the judge uh, giving the ceremony was very somber. He was very nice. During the ceremony, I, I mean, I, my feelings were I was happy to see the two of them so happy. It really was. They're a beautiful couple. I mean, they're two Priscilla's so gorgeous and so is Elvis. And these two nice, fun-loving people. It was it was very exciting. I mean, as far as feelings going, uh, I was excited to be there. I was excited to be part of it and to realize my, how my life had changed since before I went in the Army because of meeting this man. And, uh, and I felt very honored that I was there right at this, at this time. Colonel had a press conference set up. Went immediately from the ceremony, right, to the press conference, and the press was there and talked about how he felt about getting married and all that. And, uh, and after that, we went to a, a little wedding reception. You know, had some cake and uh, musicians and playing some nice music, had some cake and some food, and had a little party there just for the family and friends. Then we all went back to our planes, flew right back to Palm Springs. In the meantime, Rona Barrett is sitting in front of the house in Palm Springs, waiting for Elvis to get married. And she was so mad when she heard that we were in Las Vegas and it was announced that Elvis got married. Uh, it was great because we, we fooled the press and Elvis liked to always knew that. He, he liked to have his own privacy and it worked there. So when we got back to Palm Springs, we all sat and relaxed, it was over with. It was a beautiful day. We were sitting outside in the sun around the deck of Priscilla and Elvis and me and everybody else part of the, the family and Vernon and Priscilla's family. And I, I can just remember Elvis got up from his chair and went over and cut a rose for Priscilla from one of the rose bushes back there and brought it to her. I never saw Elvis do something like that before, but it, it was a nice touch. I thought it was a very nice, a warm, romantic touch. We had a nice dinner. The maids were there to cook a nice dinner for all of us. We all sat around, talked, it was relaxed, wonderful. And then uh, we called it a night. And then we only stayed there a couple of days, then we went back to Memphis. And Elvis really had his uh, honeymoon in, at, in Memphis at uh, the ranch. He had a ranch in Mississippi at the time. And uh, that's where he spent his honeymoon. A lot of people don't realize Elvis did take vacations because when you're a big celebrity it's hard to get away and be privately and be on your own so but Hawaii was his favorite place and once he started making movies there he really enjoyed it there the people treated him wonderful he always liked to go there he loved the warmth I can I remember when we get off the plane there's just a feeling of relaxation when you get off the plane in Hawaii and that was one of the places I know that Elvis really enjoyed he felt relaxed he was himself he had no pressures on his shoulder and we went there many, many times, spent a lot of, a lot of days there. And I'd rent a house on a private beach someplace, but he, we always stayed at the hotel, at the Hilton Hotel, because he liked the privacy and the security of the hotel. 
but yet during the day we'd party at the house. He'd relax on the beach, later he'd get a tan, he'd go out body surfing, we did some snorkeling there, and then the people on the beaches didn't bother Elvis. They were told, leave him alone, he's on vacation. This is Nora and Lamar Fike with Elvis and Priscilla. This is uh, Lamar's wife, Nora, Priscilla, Patsy, and my wife, Joan. Tom Jones was performing in Hawaii at that time while we were there. We went to see a show the night before and invited Tom out to visit the house, lay around by the pool, lay out by the beach. It was a great day. Tom enjoyed it. We had a little champagne. We made a peanut butter sandwich for Tom. He'd never had peanut butter in his life. He really didn't like it. This press conference in Hawaii was there for Elvis to announce the charity concert for the USS Arizona Memorial. He was putting on this concert to help raise money for the Navy. On one of the vacations in Hawaii, Elvis decided to take our wives and the whole group of us out to see the USS Arizona Memorial that he helped build. This was the first time he would seen it after he put on the concert in Hawaii. The Admiral's yacht picked us up, took us out there, showed us around. It was very nice. They kept the crowds away. They didn't let any of the tourist boats come on the memorial while we were there. It was very, very somber and beautiful, and they had a big plaque saying that Elvis contributed to this memorial. And it was a very uh, touching moment. Elvis was a very patriotic person. He loved the United States. He knew this was the only country in the world that, from a poor kid, could turn out to be a big superstar the way he was. And he was really thrilled that he helped to leave his mark behind here with the Arizona Memorial. This was the only vacation Elvis took out of the country. We decided to go to Bahamas one time and a little change from Hawaii, uh, which not too many people know about, went to Paradise Island. Just had a great time there. Just went out a couple of islands and a little snorkeling, uh, just fun. He was just, he had a great time, but those are the places he enjoyed the most. The, the warm weather places, the Bahamas and Hawaii and, and Vail was the opposite. Uh, we did some snowmobiling there. And it was great because he could drive around in a snowmobile and he'd have a ski mask on. People wouldn't know who he was. That was the place that he'd stay up all day and sleep at nighttime. He usually always slept in the daytime and party all night. During the touring years, we were chartering planes for different tours. You know, we chartered the Playboy Bunny plane, a couple other chartered planes. So Elvis decided he wanted his own airplane. Now, I know nothing about airplanes, but he, he brought, called me in, he called Lamar Fike in. Lamar knew a little bit about airplanes, more than I did, that's for sure. And he said, I'm looking for an airplane. I want a private plane so we can fix it up and use that to fly around the country. So Lamar and I got a hold of this gentleman that was a, a used plane salesman. He was down in Florida, and we got a hold of him, and we flew to Tucson, Arizona. I didn't know this is like the biggest huge airplane lot in the world. Go to Tucson, he takes us out to the desert, and there's planes, hundreds of planes, just lined up like a big car lot. So we're driving around, we told him we wanted, Elvis wanted a four engine jet, because he felt more secure with four engines. Seats about 120 people. So we started going down, he's showing us these airplanes as we're going along, going in and out. And so he shows us this one 880 Convair. It was a Delta airplane. It was owned by Delta Airlines and it was retired. We go in, nice plane, four engine jet, held 100 people when it was a passenger plane. We asked him why, why was it retired? What was wrong with it? He said, nothing's wrong with it. He says, but the engines burn a lot of fuel, too much fuel for the airlines. It was too expensive to operate. But it was a, it was a good price range at the time. I think it was 275000 But we'd have to put all new equipment inside, gut it out, and all the radio equipment and radar and everything. So we called Elvis up. He said, Elvis, we think we'd found a plane for you. And Elvis said, well, to describe it, 400 jet, 880 Convair. Elvis says, OK, we'll get it. I said, what do you mean get it? You've got to come and look at it. You know, it's $275,000 here. He said, no. He says, you know, I don't know much about planes. The guy told you about it. We'll buy it. That was it. The guy went down and saw Vernon, made all the contracts up. Uh, Elvis then decided to, you know, do the interior. He had a, figure it out and lay it out. Did a beautiful job. I mean, I think it's a great idea, you know, the bedrooms in the back, and it was great. It was a beautiful airplane. And 
that's the Lisa Marie that you see at Graceland today. It's there on display for people to see. It gave us a lot of freedom. A lot of times you'd say, we're at home. He said, let's go to Denver today. Okay, call everybody up, get the crew, fly to Denver. Spend a little while there. Okay, let's go to Palm Springs. And he loved it. We didn't know what was happening before we went to the next because we could be home sound asleep. He said, call, okay, we're going to Palm Springs this weekend. Okay, jump in the plane, you know, and go. I remember our trip to New York. Elvis was getting ready to do four concerts at Madison Square Garden. He never played Matt in New York before, and he's always told New York audiences are tough, they're really hard on people, they, they want you to go, okay, show them what you can do. So he was a little concerned about it. So uh, Colonel set up a big press conference at the, we were staying at the New York Hilton. Elvis, uh, amazing to me, was very relaxed. He walked into that press conference, his dad was there, all of us guys were there. He was great with the press. They, Great questions they asked him, and he would just go along and answer his questions, and it was, it was super. And the good thing about it, we went and did the show. Elvis was a nervous wreck. He didn't know how he'd be accepted. But when he walked on that stage and the crowd went crazy, he really relaxed. That night, next day, the reviews hit the paper, and they were the best reviews we've ever seen. They just thought Elvis was unbelievable. Now, New York press is real tough on people. But he felt so good about it. And the next few shows after that, he was just in flying high. He just felt so good about it. He was, he was accepted in New York City. And that was quite an experience for all of us. We were all concerned. There's so many places that I haven't been yet. I, I've, I've never played New York here. You know. I've never been to Britain either. You know. I, I'd like it to, yes, sir. I'd like to very much. I'd like to go to Europe. I'd like to go to Japan. And all those places. I've never been out of this country except in the service, you know. No, I stopped using that greasy kid stuff, too. <laughs> Just like everybody else did, man. Man, I was tame compared to what they do now. Are you kidding? I, <laughs> I didn't do anything. We just jiggle, you know. You know. I really can't criticize anybody, I, you know, in the entertainment field. I, I think there's room for everybody, and I, I hate to criticize another performer, you know. Well, the image is one thing, and a human being is another, you know. It's, 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 it's very hard to live up to an image, I'll put it that way. Well, I found that uh, in the audiences that we have, it's, it's mixed. It's, it's older people, younger people, and, and the very young, and uh, all types of people. It's, it's hard to find good material in our days, you know, for everybody, for all of us, you know. It, it's just, it, it's very difficult to find any good hard rock songs. Really. If I could find them, I, I, I would do them, you know. You know, I, I would like to think that we've, we've improved ourselves over the past 15 years. That's what I mean. I mean musically and vocally and everything. I like to think that I've improved over the past 15 years. If nobody, if nobody saw me or if nobody uh, recognized me or whatever, or an for an autograph, I, to, to me it's just part of the business and I, you know, I, I accept it. I think I would miss it. I happened to be there when Elvis met Priscilla in Germany. She was this young little 14-year-old girl. I didn't realize she was 14. I don't think Elvis did either. Uh, this cute little girl walked in the door, beautiful face and uh, nice. She was nervous. You could see she was nervous. She comes in a room with all these guys in there, and Elvis to top it off. <coughs> he jumped off, jumped out of his chair and ran over and said hello to her and introduced himself. And they started talking and and. Uh, they sat and we just left them alone. They talked for, for that evening and they got to know each other as we went along. It was tough being Elvis's girlfriend. You know, when you think about it, uh, just uh, girls chasing him all the time, uh, uh, temptations there, and she had to be very strong. She had to be a very strong person. And I remember when Priscilla was pregnant with Lisa Marie, Elvis was so excited. I mean, Elvis, like I told you before, he loved kids and he loved animals, and he was so thrilled that he was gonna have his own child. And going to the hospital, Elvis was just like any other person, just thrilled as could be. He's got a daughter now, and he's a father. And, and I remember the smile on his face. I mean, he was, you know, it wasn't Elvis Presley now, it was just the man that had a daughter. This is 1174 Hillcrest Drive, Truesdale Estates. This house brings back a lot of memories. This is the house that Elvis and Priscilla were living in when they got married. And this was Lisa and Marie's first California home. 
brings back a lot of memories because the house next door is Danny Thomas's house. At one time, Elvis wanted to buy that lot before Danny built his house there, and he missed it by about two weeks, so he ended up buying this house for himself. It's a beautiful house. We used to have a lot of family gatherings up here, and uh, we used to have a lot of Easter egg hunts, and uh, it was fun. It was great, beautiful home. This is 144 Monteville Drive. This is the house that Elvis and Priscilla bought after the Hillcrest home. They needed a bigger house. The great thing about this house, had a lot of room for Lisa, big backyard. Lived uh, up till 1977. Beautiful home, they had a good time here. Lisa Marie, she is a, such a cute little kid. I had two daughters. My oldest daughter, Debbie, is a little older than, than Lisa Marie, and my youngest daughter, Cindy, is a one year older than Lisa. So they were pretty well raised together. We hung out together at Easter egg hunts. We had parties and birthday parties together, and we visited each other, and we went on vacation together. And uh, uh, she was great. She was a great smile. She had a good time. She was this funny little girl, and uh, uh, she just uh, had a great personality. I mean, she was, she was just like another little kid. She was Elvis Presley's daughter, but she still was just another young kid going through life, having a good time. Elvis spoiled her. Elvis would buy her anything she wanted, things she shouldn't even need, fur coats, uh, different little things, you know, diamond rings. Priscilla would say, Elvis, that's enough, you know, just don't buy her all those things. You know, she doesn't need it, you're gonna spoil her. That was the father. And I, I guess he probably felt guilty too, because he traveled a lot. He was gone from home a lot, so whatever she wanted, he would get her. Yeah. She was a great mother. She was a very great mother to her daughter. She really raised Lisa very well, very concerned about her, very supportive of her daughter. Elvis is a very generous person. Priscilla's older brother, Don, was visiting Memphis one day, and Elvis decided to get him a new car. So he had Jerry Schilling go downtown, get a new Mustang for him. Elvis invited Don outside, and Colonel Beaulieu was there, and Priscilla, and uh, Jerry brought the car, pulled it up in front, and uh, gave it to Don. And Don was just thrilled. What, what could you say? This young man with a brand new Mustang. Elvis knew Priscilla loved horses. So he decided to buy her one. So then he saw the horse he got for her. He decided he wanted a horse too. Then all of a sudden he had to buy horses for all of us. We all became cowboys. Bought a big ranch in Mississippi. And now we're here living on a big ranch. One day Elvis decided to buy all of us guys motorcycles. He wanted his little motorcycle gang. We called them L's Angels. We used to go take these rides on the weekends. We'd go up to the mountains, up around the Los Angeles area. And uh, it was great. It was uh, myself, uh, Jerry Schilling, Red West, Sonny West, and a whole group of us would just take off and we'd have a ball. You see, sometimes we'd come to a stoplight and people would recognize Elvis and they'd start screaming and we'd take off and just Elvis loved to tease the fans once in a while too. But it was fun. I enjoyed it a lot. People have a... Uh a uh, wrong impression of Colonel Tom Parker, Elvis's manager. He was a very nice man. I mean, he was a tough businessman. He separated business from friendship. That's very important. And I don't think anybody else could have handled Elvis Presley except for Colonel Tom Parker. They had an agreement. They were partners. They were a team together. People don't realize it. All they hear is how tough the Colonel was. And, but Colonel was a soft man, too. When he was friends and family and kids, he loved kids, and he was real nice to them. But when it came to business, if you didn't do your job, he'd chew you out. He chewed me out many times if I made a mistake. But the relationship between two of them, they would sit and talk privately alone. They would talk their business. So the stories about Colonel taking advantage of Elvis is not true. I mean, Colonel made mistakes. He was a human being. He made his mistakes in business and some deals he made. But overall, the two of them were a team. And that's what people have to understand. I remember my first experience when meeting Colonel Tom Parker. We were in Nashville doing a recording session, and uh, the colonel didn't know who I was either. So he was a Chicago guy. And so I meet him, and fine, he was very distant for a while. And uh, But I think once he realized I wasn't there just to be a hanger-on and do what I had to do and help Elvis make sure everything was taken care of, and we became very good friends too. So it was, uh, it was strange at first. I felt uncomfortable, and I know they did too.
Elvis was very popular in Texas. I mean, he started out there playing little clubs when he was a nobody. And uh, he, was just even, he was just signed with Sun Records. And, but he played Texas a lot. He was well known in Texas. And they treated him so great. Uh, I remember when we went to do this show at the Astrodome, uh, all the important people of Texas were there. And we all wanted to meet Elvis. And they gave him a, a Stetson hat. And they gave him a gold watch and awards. Elvis Day in, in Texas. You can see Elvis having a good time. I remember the first time uh, Elvis played the, the Astrodome. Now, I mean, at that time, that was the biggest indoor stadium in the world. This was the biggest crowd Elvis had ever had to play to. The only bad thing about it, he was in the middle of the, the field. And he was so far from the audience that it didn't give him a warm feeling. He couldn't sing to the people. But uh, the crowd was just amazing. I mean, there was so much screaming and yelling, you could hardly hear Elvis. And that was a, quite a, a, a big event for him, I'll tell you. It was during the rodeo, you know. Elvis was event number eight. And we used to kid him about it. Elvis, you come up right, right after the bulls. <laughs> and we kid him about it. He'd, he'd get mad at us about it. But uh, it was uh, quite exciting. And uh, it was exciting for me, especially because I'd never been inside of a big stadium like that to see that 50, 60,000 people at a concert. And Elvis uh, was very nervous about that. Here we are in beautiful downtown Burbank, home of the NBC studios, where Elvis shot the 68 Singer Special. It was called the Singer Special because Singer Sewing Machines was a sponsor at that time. And today it's known as the Elvis Comeback Special. Colonel Parker came up with an idea to do a Christmas special for Elvis. And the Colonel's idea was to do a, a nice special with NBC, and then they could play it every year, like you see a lot of specials done. So they had the meetings, Elvis agreed to it, and uh, he met with the, the director, uh, which was Steve Bender, and the Bones Howe was one of the producers. And they met and they talked. And they got to know Elvis. So they got Elvis alone in the room. We talked about the ideas and discussions. And Steve said, I don't like to do a, I don't want to do a Christmas special. Why don't we just do a special with you? Elvis said, hey, sounds good to me. Well, then they went, Bob Finko went and talked to the Colonel. And Colonel got all upset about it. He said, wait a minute, this is supposed to be a Christmas special. And, you know, why'd you guys influence Elvis? And, but they already got to Elvis, and that's the way it was. But the Colonel said, listen, you got to do a couple of Christmas songs. So we played at Christmas time. He agreed. Did the special. It was the first time Elvis had done a special. And NBC mentioned to the Colonel, he says, okay, who are we going to have as guest stars on the show? And they said, we don't need any guest stars. Elvis is a star. He can carry the show. And when you think about it, all the specials you see always have guest stars. Elvis was the star, and that was it. And he had a great time doing it. He enjoyed it. It was a new experience for him. He really got into it. In fact, uh, he even slept in the dressing room. And every he went home, he, they set it up so he could sleep there because he didn't want to get out of the mood of the, while we were doing the tapings. And uh, had a ball. And I tell you, it was the highest rated show of that year on television. The director uh, wanted to have a nice finale for that TV special, something different, a message song. And he talked to Elvis about it. He said, OK, come up with the right song. Let me hear it. So they went to the, one of the songwriters, and uh, they told him what they would like to have a nice message song, something that people would understand, and Elvis could sing with heart. This guy went home. In three days, he wrote this song, If I Can Dream. And it couldn't have been a better song. If, if you see the show and you watch the special, came back to the studio, played it for Elvis. Elvis loved it and recorded it. And that is probably one of the best songs you'll ever hear Elvis ever sing. You can see he sang with feeling and heart. And we shot that thing at 3 o'clock in the morning, all by himself on that stage. They really got into it. It was one of the best songs he ever recorded. One of the jobs of being a road manager with a celebrity like Elvis, you should have to make sure everything was coordinated with the, our security guys, with Red, Sonny, and Jerry, and make sure they knew where they were had to go. And they, they made sure they knew where Elvis had to be at a certain place at a certain time, made sure Elvis got there, and made sure I would go up there and check the stage because every stage we went to a different city was a different setup. I'd explain to him, watch out when you walk up the stairs, you go to the left, or don't step over the cables over here. And then that was my job, really, one of them. I would walk him onto the stage, and I would tell him just before he walked up where to go. Then at the end of the show, after the show was over, all of a sudden, these spotlights in his eyes during the whole show, he could hardly see. And the minute they turned it off, he's blind for a few minutes. So he'd come to the right of the stage or the left stage. I'd be standing there waiting for him. And he'd put, if you see some any kind of footage, you'll see Elvis put his hands on my shoulder, and he knew I'd walk him down the steps. 
and walk him right to the car, and we jump in the car and take off. So he was blind, and people always said to me, why, why does he grab you as he walked off stage? Because he couldn't see where he was going. And that's, that's one of the jobs of a road manager, make sure he got where he had to be. And a lot of times on stage, you know, all of us guys would be up there security-wise, and he'd grab you and drag you on stage, you know you don't want to be there, and it'd embarrass you and make, make joke about you or something like that. He, he had a good time on stage. Well, I think the Six Days Special made all of us want to go back on the road again. He enjoyed singing in front of the people. He looked great. I mean, anybody that sees that special today always tell me that's the, the best I see Elvis look, the best he performed. He sounded great. He was having a good time. Elvis signed a contract with the International Hotel. A colonel knew this gentleman, the president of the International, his name was Alex Shufi. Kirk Kikorian owned the hotel. Did that, signed up a deal twice a year for five years. They made a big contract, he couldn't turn it down. Started, did that, successful, sold out show every night. You couldn't get in the place. The hotel was just unbelievable. Then we started going on tour. Elvis loved being on stage, performing in front of a lot of audiences. Colonel would set up these tours two weeks at a time, never a day off between shows. We'd do seven days a week, two on Saturday and two on Sundays. There was a show in a different city every night. It was great, because we didn't go on a long period of time. We'd go on two weeks, come back, take a break for about a month, go out and do another few, two, three weeks. It was exciting. And we would fly into a town, go to sleep, get up the next afternoon, do the show, go right to the airplane, go to the next town. We were just constantly moving. But it was exciting, it was fun, Elvis enjoyed it, and you could see he was having a great time. The whole 70s was like that. But after a while, it gets a little tiring too, you gotta take some breaks. But it's so funny, you, sit and you complain, hey, let's get a break, then a week later, you get antsy, you gotta go someplace, you gotta move. So he called the colonel and says, set up a tour again, will you? And we set up a tour and go on the road again. Well, I think the Six Days Special made Elvis wanna go back on the road again. He enjoyed singing in front of the people, and that really was the influence of Elvis going back on the road. He had a meeting with the colonel. So he said to Elvis, you want to go back on the road? I will set it up. And that's where it led to Elvis signing up for Las Vegas at the International Hotel. And that's where it led to us going back on the road. We did the Astrodome. We started touring. Elvis got his confidence back. He was a little concerned about being gone so long. But that was Elvis's real life. He loved to be on stage doing live performances. When Elvis did the 68 special, Bill Ballou, was the costume designer, made these great outfits for Elvis. The black leather suit, unbelievable. Well, when Elvis started going on the road again, he wanted Bill to design his suits for him. Designed a couple of suits that were like really tuxedo karate outfits, but he kept tearing the pants out of his pants. So when he made his karate moves, the pants would have a tendency to drop down a little bit and he would tear the seats out. And that's where the jumpsuit idea came from. The idea is a jumpsuit doesn't slide down, so you can make the karate moves without tearing them out. And Elvis got creative with him. He'd sit and talk to him. He said, oh, yeah, I would like a, a peacock on this one or a tiger because his nickname in karate was the tiger. So he had one made with a big tiger on it and then a lot of patriotic ones with the Aloha from Hawaii special and the American Eagle because Elvis was a very patriotic person. As far as costumes, the fans, it didn't matter what Elvis wore. They just wanted to see Elvis. They didn't care if he wore a karate, a pair of jeans. It didn't matter. That, that's it. And he didn't change during the show because Elvis didn't want to take a break. Elvis did his show, he blasted right through it, and it was over with. One thing about Elvis when he was on stage, he sang with all his heart. 
He sang with feeling, and that's what people loved about him. And they all felt that Elvis was singing right to them individually. Nobody performed like Elvis, ever. A lot of celebrities go on stage, they sing their songs, so they have to, and that's it. Elvis never did that. And Elvis changed his shows during performances. Elvis didn't have a set lineup. Yes, he had the first song he walked on stage with, and he ended with the same song. But during the show, his band was so great that he could throw a song at him, and they do it. Because it would drive them crazy. They could say, oh, no, what's he going to do tonight? But he was great about that. He kept the band sharp that way, too. They really paid attention. They had to watch him at all times. And he would just sing and throw a song at him. Or he'd go down, sit at the piano, start playing, and start singing. Elvis was very relaxed on stage and uh, didn't bother the fans at all. If he missed a word, made a mistake, they thought it was funny. He just got away with murder. They had a set list, pretty much so, you know, of what the list was going to go. But he would change as he went along. What's what he felt on stage. Or somebody might throw a song at him from the audience. Hey, let me hear so-and-so. He said, okay, and he'd sing it. You know, the band would be ready, and they would just go ahead and do it. The idea of giving scarves away to the fans, something to have a little souvenir of Elvis, came about when Colonel Parker one time in Las Vegas had these little teddy bears. And he told Elvis, he said, Elvis, you know, when you'd sing teddy bear, throw some teddy bears out to the people in the audience. And he saw the reaction from that. The people go crazy for this something that Elvis had in his hand. So then Elvis, with some of his outfits, he did have scarves. They were his own personal scarves, and he'd wore them out there, and he'd dry the sweat off his face. And one time, you know, he got down there, and he kissed a little girl from the stage, and she took the scarf from him. Fine, good. So that's where the idea came from. Give them something to walk away with that belonged to me. And that's how I came up with it, the idea. Elvis liked to have a big band and orchestra and backup singers. He loved voices. And uh, Millie Kirkland was his backup singer when we first started going back on tour in the 70s. But Millie was a little older and she couldn't travel as much. So he heard about this young lady, Kathy Westmoreland. I uh, heard about her, and they had Tom Diskin and a couple of the other people check into her. And uh, Kathy uh, fit in perfect. And uh, here, here's a little bit of Kathy right here. There were actually three different people who had recommended me to Elvis when he, he asked people in L.A. who they'd recommend. They all recommended me, and he thought, well, I think I better call this girl. I got a call one Friday afternoon <laughs> asking... Uh, if I could fly immediately to Vegas, saying that he needed a replacement for uh, Millie Kirkham at the time. It was August of 1970. So I got the call to go for just a couple of weeks with Elvis. And uh, really I was not a, you know, a fan, so to speak, and uh, had, didn't appreciate what he did that much. I, there were some records I had, had liked, but I wasn't a fan. After the very first show that I saw, and having met him as a person really impressed me, uh, it w I was just in awe of his talent that, had, you know, somehow or another had never reached me via record as it did everyone else. But in person, it was just magical. And to this day, I've never seen a performer with that. I knew at the time that it was special. There was always that awareness that there was something very special happening. Looking back now, it's magnified a billion times to me. But, uh, there was that, I think everybody who was associated with him had this feeling that, that we were all somehow meant to be together. It was a very odd experience. After Elvis was divorced, he met a girl by the name of Linda Thompson. She was from Memphis. George Klein introduced her to Elvis. This girl, great personality. Linda is one of those people that's always up. She's happy, she jokes around, she's funny, she's beautiful. She was perfect for Elvis at that time. I tell you, she just worked out perfect. Elvis loved her. They spent a lot of time together. She was always positive. She's a very positive person. She still is today. And that was a great thing about it. But as years went on and she saw that, uh, you know, there was one of their great together, but she wanted to go further from there. She wanted to take her life a little further, and I don't think she wanted to be around this. It was too much for her, traveling, going here and there and everywhere. She just wanted to settle down a little more and just have a real normal life, so they, they went their separate ways. It was tough for Elvis, but uh, Linda was great for Elvis.
I'm standing here in front of the old MGM studios. Elvis made the majority of his pictures here. Uh, it was a lot of fun, had great times, uh, had a great dressing room. We had a lot of parties here. While we were making the movies here, a lot of celebrities that were shooting other pictures on the lot would come over and visit. They would hang out with Elvis, and he would talk to them and get experiences from them, little acting tips, and uh, it was great. It was just like one big party for many years. Well, Elvis didn't get to know the stars, I mean, the people that he didn't meet that well. Elvis did not associate himself too many with Hollywood stars and parties, more or less like just ordinary people. He didn't feel comfortable around them. Uh, I don't know if it was insecurities or uh, Elvis is basically a very shy individual, and uh, he felt more comfortable with just his friends and people we'd meet, and you know, he'd invite some of the co-stars to the house in the evenings and sit around and talk and, you know, just play music and just chit-chat, really. Here's the first year that Don Sutton, the pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers, came to visit Elvis. He was a big fan of his, and we all posed for a nice picture. As you know, Elvis is a big football fan, and he heard Jim Brown was doing a movie over 20th Century Fox. So we contacted a friend of ours named Rick Husky, and he brought Jim Brown over to meet Elvis. From left to right is Billy Smith, Elvis's cousin, Alan Fortis, a good friend, Richard Davis, and Jim Brown right in the middle there, big and tall, Elvis naturally, myself, Marty Lacker, and James Kingsley. The governor of Tennessee, Buford Ellington, decided to declare Elvis Presley Day. And here we pose with a picture with the governor and his beautiful daughter, Anne. Here I am with Tuesday Well, Elvis's co-star from Wild in the Country. She was such a great person. She became like one of the buddies. I and mean, her and Elvis dated for a little while. A lot of times you get different celebrities who come on the stage and just watch Elvis film. You know, Elvis was the biggest star in Hollywood at that time, too. I mean, everybody wanted to meet him. What's this new young uh, rock and roll star here in Hollywood? So what's he like? And they would come and stand in the background and, and watch. And in between takes, Elvis would go talk to them. And I would say hello to them, meet them. Uh, they were very nice. They were just like ordinary people, which you never think. People don't think stars are just like anybody else. But uh, it was nice to realize that a lot of them were just like anybody else. When you're on the road with a big star like Elvis, you have to be really concerned about security. We had probably the best security team around. And uh, it was all scoped out which way we go in and out of hotels, get to the concert. We'd had to fool people, fool the press and fans because we didn't want any problems leaving and coming in. And our security guards, Red West and Sonny West, uh, Dick Grobe, they were all great. They were so professional. In fact, we were recommended by a lot of people to set up security for them, but we never did that. This was our private thing. And it was not easy for Elvis going in and out of these places because the fans didn't mean anything by it, but they were there. And Elvis was the type of person who would not push his friends away. He wanted to sit and talk to him and sign autographs. He felt obligated to do that. But there's times we couldn't do that because it would take too long to get in and out of the places. So we sort of really rushed him in and out. It was, if it was up to him, he'd sit and sign autographs for hours. But, you know, we had to get to his show or we had to catch a plane. And uh, so it was not easy. But the bad thing about it, we always saw the back of the hotel, the back of the concerts. We never saw any of the cities people would say to you, when you go to these cities, it must be so wonderful to travel and see all these beautiful places. We saw nothing. We saw loading docks, walk through kitchens, up freight elevators, in and out. That's the way we traveled. Later on in years, uh, we were dubbed the Memphis Mafia. And the, how we got that is because Elvis liked to have us do things in different ways. He, he got us all wearing black mohair suits, white shirts, white ties, or a black shirt and a black tie. So in a big limousine, we pull up in front of the hotels in Las Vegas and different places. It looked like the mob got out of the car. All these guys get out, and then Elvis comes out like the Don comes out after, you know? So I think a couple of reporters ended up saying, hey, who are those guys? And the guy said, these are Elvis and his Memphis friends. He said, oh, the Memphis Mafia. And that's where it came out of. And some reporter picked it up and ended up, we ended up in the paper as being Elvis and the Memphis Mafia. And we were titled that. And Elvis thought it was pretty funny. He thought it was great because uh, he liked the old gangster movies and he thought they had an exciting life. And uh, he liked the mob idea because he figured the mob is very, very loyal. They expect loyalty from their friends. And Elvis was the same way. He expected loyalty from his friends. So he enjoyed the title. He thought it was great. Elvis did a special from Hawaii called Low Up in Hawaii. It was a satellite show. Colonel Parker was sometimes watching the news and uh, he saw something, you know, 
maybe President Nixon at the time or something like that, by, by a satellite. And Colonel came up with an idea, said, why don't we do a, a special on satellite around the world? Now, Colonel didn't even know if this could, be, this could happen. But see, RCA at that time had the satellite, so he went to RCA and said, listen, why don't we do a TV special that can be broadcast around the world at one time, live? And the idea was we did it in Hawaii because they knew Elvis loved Hawaii, he'd be more relaxed there. And timetable-wise, from around the world, it could be broadcast in more countries live at that time. I mean, and think about it, Elvis was the first entertainer in history to do a live satellite show around the world, and now it happens all the time. And uh, Elvis did the show. He was so relaxed, we thought he'd be so nervous because he had a, that was a set one-hour show. At the end of the hour, you're off the satellite. So the time was very important, and it worked out perfect, the way Elvis timed it himself, and just and he was relaxed and did it. And, it was a breeze. I mean, Elvis was a very patriotic individual. He loved the United States. He'd do anything for it. That's why he designed the, the, the American Eagle jumpsuit. And that was very important that he had that jumpsuit for that show. And that's where it became so famous. And at the end of the show, as you notice, he takes the, the cape and throws it out at the audience. Some little kid got it. And this big, beautiful American Eagle is spread out on it. That's the way Elvis was about things like that. It wasn't important to him. He made somebody else happy out there. March of 1977, Elvis wanted to get away and go to Hawaii. So we made arrangements. I made arrangements over there. I got a house, got a hotel, and we got on the Lisa Marie. It was about 20, 25 of us. Elvis was dating a girl by the name of Ginger Alden at that time. If you look at her picture, she looks a lot like Priscilla. So we all get on a plane, go to Hawaii. Elvis was feeling great. I mean, he was a little overweight. I mean, he didn't look as good. But if you, if you see the pictures, he's smiling, having a good time, playing a little touch football, relaxing on the beach, uh, having a good time. Everybody said, was Elvis so depressed the last couple of years of his life? Yes, there was times he was, wasn't happy and sad. He was, didn't know about his future. But if you look at these pictures, you'll see he's having a great time. He's smiling. I really will never forget that vacation. That was his final vacation. Okay, I'll try and set the record straight on Elvis's passing away. <clears throat> August 16, 1977, we were getting ready to go on tour. That evening, we were supposed to fly to Portland, Maine. I was there at the house. It was in the afternoon around 2 o'clock. Al Strada, his wardrobe man, was there packing the wardrobe cases. I was down there on the phone talking to different people and making arrangements with the flight crew to fly out that evening phone call comes from upstairs on the intercom. And, and Ginger called down and uh, talked to the maid. She says, Any, is anybody down there? So well, Al is right here. So she hands the phone to Al Strada. She says, Al, come upstairs. Elvis has fainted. And Al runs upstairs. And he calls down with great cause, calls me. He says, Joe, come up here. I need you right away. So I ran upstairs. I go into the bathroom. And I see Elvis on the floor. Uh, he was sitting, he fell off from, from the, the commode. Uh, his face was buried in the carpeting, and I bent down real quick, and I touched him, and uh, I could, he was, Rigor Morris had set in. And uh, so I turned him over real quick. I pulled up his pajamas bottoms. I turned him over and laid down, and uh, I heard a little breath of air come out of his lungs. So I thought maybe there was a, he was, it was going to be okay, but I just didn't feel comfortable about it. Grab the phone real quick. There's a phone on the wall right next to the commode, and I called 911, and uh, I said, we need an ambulance at Graceland. We should get somebody real quick. And then Al picked up the phone and tried to get Dr. Nick while I was trying to. Uh, now, there's a, there's a story that says I gave Elvis mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I did not give Elvis mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. No, you couldn't. His mouth was closed shut. 
and there was no way I could open his mouth, So, but I did try to massage on his heart. At that point, uh, things were starting to happen. Uh, Vernon was in the office. He came up to the, to the bathroom. He came in, and he started, you know, saying, Elvis, Elvis, you know, don't, don't leave us, you know, just hang in there. And, and then Ginger was there, and Lisa Marie was at Graceland at the time. Lisa came running around, and Ginger, was, she's standing there too, and I asked Ginger, please get Lisa out of here. And uh, we're waiting for the ambulance to show up. And meanwhile, uh, uh, Al got a hold of Dr. Nick. Uh, he was on his way to, to, to Graceland. Uh, the ambulance shows up. It seemed like it took forever for the ambulance to get there. Uh, the, the guys came up, and uh, they started lifting Elvis up and got him on the stretcher. We went out the back, out the front door, rather, took Elvis in the stretcher, um, got him in the back of the ambulance. Just as we got out there, uh, Dr. Nick pulled up. He jumped out of his car, jumped in the back of the ambulance, and it was Charlie Hodge, Dr. Nick, and myself went to the hospital with Elvis. Uh, we got to the Baptist Memorial Hospital. The ride to the, to the hospital seemed like it took forever, too, and Dr. Nick was trying to talk to Elvis, so, you know, stay, hang in there, and he had the, whatever that bottle is, with the oxygen over his mouth, hoping that could revive him. Um, uh, got to the hospital, uh, the emergency room people were waiting for us when we got there. Uh, took him on, on a stretcher and took him into the emergency room real quick. And they stopped me and uh, Charlie from coming in there. And Dr. Nick went in there and they escorted Charlie and I to another room. Meanwhile, all, I guess, all hell was breaking loose in different parts and the rumors were getting around. And uh, Elvis's cousin, Billy Smith, came to the hospital, uh, met me there. Um, uh, I don't even remember who else showed up. And they took us in the room. We were sitting there waiting to find out what was going on. And about 20 minutes later, Dr. Nick came into the, into the room where we were. And he walked and he said, Elvis is gone. And uh, it was hard. And uh, the PR guy from the hospital uh, wanted to know if I want to make the announcement to the press. And uh, I said, I'll try. But meanwhile, uh, Dr. Nick said, don't say anything to anybody yet. I'm going to go back to the house and tell Vernon before he hears it on the news. So he, the police department was there, and they took Dr. Nick out to the hospital, out to the house. And uh, meanwhile, I got on the phone and called uh, Priscilla to tell her that uh, Elvis is gone. And uh, she wasn't home at the time. I got a hold of her sister, Michelle. And Michelle uh, said, uh, what's wrong? And I said, I got to talk to Priscilla. And just so happened, Priscilla came in the house at the time, and I told her what happened. And she went hysterical. And she said, how's Lisa? How's Lisa? I said, Lisa's fine. You know, don't worry about that. And so I'll make arrangements to have the plane come out and get you. And uh, then I called Colonel Parker in Portland, Maine, and got him on the phone and told him what happened. And he sort of didn't know what to say. He was in shock at the time. He said, OK, do what you have to do. I'll be there this evening. And uh, at that point, uh, press was all starting to show up. The rumors were getting around. The newspapers were showing up. And radio stations were announcing Elvis is in the hospital. And uh, I just couldn't make, I couldn't go out and talk to the press. So I had the PR guy from the hospital talk to him. Uh, he made the announcement to them that Elvis had passed away of a heart attack. Charlie and Billy and I all hugged each other and uh, had the police department, one of the police department then took us back to the house at Graceland. Just went into a, a mode to help. I went and saw Vernon, talked to him, and I told him, I said, anything you need, we're here to help you. We all got together and figured out how to make arrangements for this, uh, for Elvis's uh, funeral. And we just did it. It was a lot of work. Phone calls were coming in from around the, the world. Uh, and Margaret called. She was playing Vegas at the time. And she wanted to come, and I said, well, you know, it's going to be a mess here. And she says, I'm going to come anyhow. So her and Roger Smith came, and George Hamilton showed up, and a lot of the other people who just said, just don't come. It's going to be too hectic. And we started making arrangements. And Vernon uh, asked me if we could get all white limousines for the funeral, because all of us loved white. The Memphis Funeral Home, the people came out and saw us. And Vernon wanted the same casket that he had for Elvis's mother, Gladys. Same casket for Elvis. I have to give those people credit. They, they really did a good job because it was made of solid copper. 
and uh, it weighed a ton. They had to fly it in from another state. He got all these limousines from different states around. We all just worked together and did it. It took me about three months after Elvis was gone to realize he was gone. You know, I just, we, we did what we had to do for his sake. Uh, the procession of the people coming in through the house was just unbelievable. These people were crying, they were fainting. Uh, it was tough, but we did it. And uh, I think uh, Elvis was pretty proud of the way it was handled, you know. And uh, it was a day on earth for you. Well, the image is one thing, and a human being is another. It's very hard to live up to an image, I'll put it that way. Home of the blues is where I live Trapped inside these lonely walls that won't forgive Cry like a Memphis I'm going three times under Gonna 
quite a few interesting experiences, and uh, I made a lot of friends that I never would have made otherwise. All in all, it's been a pretty good experience. newscast, everybody interrupted a newscast, and, and uh, it was just uh, like this great American hero left us. And, uh, and this is some of the newscasts that uh, you heard in the world. Good evening. Elvis Presley died today. He was 42. Apparently it was a heart attack. He was found at his home in Memphis, not breathing. His road manager tried to revive him. He failed. A hospital tried to revive him. It failed. His doctor pronounced him dead at 3 o'clock this afternoon. The end at an early age of one of the two most spectacular careers in the history of American entertainment, the other being Frank Sinatra's. Long after he became an institution, he was a part of American popular history. In the 1950s, the great swing era of Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, and Tommy Dorsey was about dead. Big band pop music had turned into what was called bop or bebop, Remote, obscure, bloodless, nobody liked it, nobody could dance to it. And then here came Elvis with a hot, stomping, steaming, sexy kind of music that turned on young people as pop music never had before. Others came along, including the Beatles, but they were all indebted to him and most of them said so. He died today. Even though he didn't drink, smoke, or drive his own car, he quit breathing at the age of 42. Here's some tape from the local Memphis station when they announced Elvis's passing. Here's Action News 5, live from the Mid-South's leading news station. Good afternoon, I'm Peggy Rolfe. And I'm Lee Edwards, sitting in for Dick Williams, and this is the news at noon. Stunned fans mill around the gates of Elvis Presley's Whitehaven mansion this afternoon while scores of fans, friends, and show business celebrities pour into Memphis for funeral services tomorrow for the king of rock and roll. Mason Granger is standing outside the gates at Graceland right now and has this live action cam report. Pan over a little bit with the camera right over here. Hundreds of people here, they've been gathering all morning long. There was only a small group at about 6 or 7 o'clock this morning, but as you can see, it's grown to a huge number of people right now at noon. Elvis Presley's body just arrived here at Graceland. A hearse carrying the singer's body left the Memphis funeral home, winding its way down Elvis Presley Boulevard to Graceland. The hearse quickly turned down a side street and pulled into Graceland by the back entrance. Elvis's coffin was taken from the hearse and placed in the mansion's music room. At three o'clock, the fans started filing in for their last view of Elvis. The coffin was open. Elvis was dressed in a white suit, blue shirt, and blue tie. Elvis's own family, some members of the family arrived last night at the Memphis International Airport, including Priscilla Presley, who is Elvis's ex-wife. She arrived with other members of the family last night to be here for Elvis's funeral tomorrow. An autopsy shows Presley died of an extremely irregular heartbeat. The exact cause of that fatal flaw may never be known, but the medical examiner says drugs were not the cause. Hypertension and a disease of the arteries may have been contributing factors. As Mason indicated earlier, the body will be on public view at Graceland this afternoon from 3 to 5 o'clock and a private service will be held tomorrow afternoon at 2. We have an unconfirmed report that singer Tom Jones will deliver the eulogy. Among the many celebrities arriving overnight for the funeral, as Mason said, were Burt Reynolds and Anne Margaret. They went straight to the Graceland Mansion. The king of rock and roll will be placed in a mausoleum at Forest Hill Cemetery. Most radio stations in Memphis are playing Elvis records, and thousands of motorists drove to work this morning with their headlights on to indicate publicly their mourning. The, the only thing I could say, besides Jesus Christ, there's no greater man that ever lived in any respect uh, in loving his friends, and loving the world and giving to the world, there's no way to express it. 
beside Jesus Christ. He's the greatest man I ever knew. After Elvis passed away in 1977, the local station in Memphis went down to Tupelo and they walked through where Elvis was born. This is called the Shotgun House. The reason it's got a name for that because if you took a shotgun and you opened the front door and opened the back door, you shoot straight through it. There was just two rooms, very uh, small, uh, but uh, hey, that's the way people lived in those days and that just goes to show you where Elvis came from. Also in 1977, that same TV station did this interview with Elvis's teacher when he was a young kid there in Tupelo, Mississippi. It's a very rare interview I've never seen before. I did know that he had great talent. He sang in the, in the schoolroom, uh, and the, the little boys and girls would love to hear him sing. He sang Old Shelf and won out at the fair, uh, second prize in my room. And uh, he had such feeding. That he, this was about a dog, and the little boys and girls, they even cried when he sang this song. Jerry Schilling, my good friend, and myself were involved in the making of This Is Elvis, documentary for Warner Brothers. And here we are standing near the Meditation Gardens. It's uh, from left to right is Jerry Schilling, Malcolm Leo, Andrew Salt, and myself. Coming back and shooting the film at Graceland was, uh, uh, it was tough because I had a lot of flashbacks and uh, knowing Elvis is no longer there. Uh, but it turned out to be a great experience. Since Elvis moved to Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee has become a tourist attraction. And since he's gone, it's even a bigger tourist attraction. Grayson's there, opened up for all the public to come and see. Sun Records, uh, where Elvis first recorded his first songs, is now a tourist attraction there. Uh, it's uh, all because of Elvis Presley. Elvis put Memphis, Tennessee on the map. The reason tourism is so big in Memphis is because of Graceland. A lot of people didn't even know where Memphis was at the time. Graceland is a pretty awesome place. It's, it's about 14 acres. It's an old uh, colonial mansion. It was a church at one time uh, before Elvis bought it. It was a church called Graceland, and that's where it got the name. Graceland had a big circular driveway, and it was great for go-kart racing. Elvis loved to do that. He had a couple go-karts, and he'd race around the driveway. A lot of big pastures for horseback riding. We did some golf cart racing on there. Elvis bought a couple golf carts, even though we didn't golf, but we used to race around, chase each other all over Graceland, the grounds. It was like Elvis's big playground. He loved it. it was, like I say, it was 14 acres, had big pastures. It was just a great place for Elvis to get away and relax. My name is Merle. I would like to welcome everyone to Graceland, the home of Elvis Presley. Elvis paid just a little over $100,000 for this property, and he was just 22 at the time he moved in. Lisa Marie and Priscilla opened Graceland to public in 1982. I think they did a great job. I mean, they, it's well organized. It's displayed beautifully, and it's gotten better every year. You go walk through the house, you know, you go through the living room, the dining room, the jungle room, and then you can go out into the trophy room, which has all of Elvis's gold records and wardrobe and different items from different movies that he did. Down the street, you can go to the car museum. All of Elvis's cars are there. And then from there, you can go over to see the Lisa Marie, the airplane. And of course, there's the meditation garden where Elvis, his father, his mother and his grandmother are buried. That's a very somber area. It's beautiful. Uh, it was one of Elvis's favorite places to sit and just meditate. But now he is there resting, and it's a beautiful area. And it's very peaceful, and uh, that is the most popular area of, of Graceland. Uh, the fans come there from all over the world, and you'll see on the wall around Graceland, they have put their own little sayings up there. They've written little notes to Elvis, how they felt about Elvis. It's amazing. About once a month, they have to clean it and have more room for other people to come right on there. On the wall of Graceland, people, they write their own little thoughts about Elvis, funny ones, uh, some real heavy ones, uh, to let people know they were there, just to show from people around the world from everywhere you could find on that wall of Graceland, and it still happens today, and they're still coming.
I've been to Sun Studios a couple of times, and uh, this is where it all started. This is where Sam Phillips had his little recording studio. Elvis recorded his first songs there, and uh, they have just redone the whole place. They, it's like it originally was when Elvis was there, and there's still some big stars come and record there today. As you can see from the control room, it's just one large room. Nothing like the recording studios of today, and it still has great sound. Elvis fans are the greatest fans in the world. No other celebrity has fans like Elvis's. They're loyal to him. January, they all come to Memphis to honor Elvis's birthday, January 8th. In August, Graceland puts on the Elvis Week. They have a candlelight vigil. And this is something, if, if nobody's ever seen this, it's amazing. In the evening, late at night, at about 8 o'clock at night, Graceland opens up the gates, and all the fans walk up the driveway with these lit candles. And they go to, the, to where Elvis is buried, there with his mother and his father, and his grandmother, and they say a few prayers and they walk around. It's very silent, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing to see. And this goes on all night. Sometimes they have 30, 40,000 people walk through that evening. And uh, I cannot think of another celebrity in the world that's been gone for as many years as Elvis is, and this still goes on every year. He's bigger than ever. It's amazing to me, and he has the greatest fans. about being an Elvis fan, as Elvis was serious about entertaining his fans. Yes, of course I'm a fan. I, I grew up, my mom always played him in the car. So growing up, I, I had him like uh, brainwashed into my head. So I always liked him, didn't really know it. Then I started hearing it when I got older and liked it. Some people might think, oh, Elvis, he's all old and dead and everything. But really, if you think about what he stands for, he's pretty cool. I mean, he donated to all these places to help out needy children and needy people. You can't judge a book by his cover. You have to get inside and see what he's all about. I come because I love Elvis and I love his message of peace and of love uh, all over the world. I've been an Elvis fan ever since I was about 10 years of age, when I first put my record on and heard it. I followed him right the way through. We love Elvis! Just up my bed and just to get a good old boy. And you just can't help but liking him greatest singer in the world, not only that, but what impressed me is uh, he turned out to be one of the greatest humanitarians that ever lived. I believe Elvis is alive in the hearts of his fans. Elvis, we love you. Things about Elvis that people want, they all want a piece of Elvis, even today. I mean, there's auctions, memorabilia auctions. Elvis had, had a if you had a Kleenex that Elvis blew his nose on, somebody would want to buy it. It's just amazing to me. And, and uh, I think over the years, all the stuff I just threw away that Elvis owned, I threw away a lot of money at one time, and I think about it. But it's still out there. People want a piece of Elvis. They want to have something that Elvis owned, Elvis touched. They put it in their bar on the wall. Or some people are really fanatics, and they'll pay thousands and thousands of dollars for an outfit that Elvis wore. And I can't think of anybody else that they do that for. I mean, a certain. Marilyn Monroe, a little James Dean, but uh, Elvis is probably the biggest star I know of that could demand the money he has today from just little items that, that were in his house. And that's, uh, that's amazing to me. I can't even understand it myself.
Well, Elvis and I were friends, you know, for many years. I met him in 1955 at the Gator Bowl. Well, we were still friends when he died, and, uh, and I just started collecting. You know, I had a few things he'd given me through the years, but I started collecting a lot of things and uh, started buying everything that was available, and everybody thought I was crazy. I had a lot of his jewelry and furniture from several of the homes, um, costumes, things like that, clothes, gold records, awards, the big speedway sign from the movie, and a lot of things like that, that that I decided to keep. You might get a kick out of this interview. Here's the man, Al DeVorn, that, that popularized the phrase, Elvis has left the building. I was the band leader then, plus booking agent, director, producer, concessionaire, a few other things. Well, I had done everything on the show, but I hadn't announced. We were opening in Minneapolis on a tour. Colonel Parker comes over to me, says, Al, this is so-and-so. Tell him about our concessions, tell him about our whole operation, our security, and he'll announce the show on this tour. So I help the guy out. The guy announces the opening show in Minneapolis. Parker comes over. He said, get rid of him. Get him off the stage. Pay him. Put him on something else. I do not want him at the microphone. I said, what's wrong? He says, Al, he doesn't fit our show. I said, but you hired him. I said, what are we doing for an announcer for the rest of the tour? He said, I have a replacement. I said, who? He says, you. I said, look, I've done everything else for you, but I'm not a qualified announcer. Don't make a fool of me. Al, he says, who's the boss? I said, you're the boss. He said, you're the announcer. So I went down to the dressing room, locked the door, looked in the mirror, and I'm talking to myself. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing's coming out right. The following night, I walked on the stage. I got as far as, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Elvis Presley Show. As I said that, goddamn lights go out, spotlights in my eye, I can't see the damn thing. We're towards the end of the show. And uh, Elvis is finishing his last number. I went to Colonel Park. I said, what do I do now when he jumps off the stage? He said, just tell him that he's gone. That's it. So Elvis runs out to the limo. He's on his way out with the gang. I went to the microphone. I said, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. Thank you and good night. No one believed me. So uh, they hung around in the... Uh, area, and I said, and don't forget those Elvis super souvenirs in living, loving color. Wonderful memento of this evening's concert you long cherish. I would go on and on and on, and we'd, we outsold anybody in the world. We held the record for sales and everything else in every stadium. That's basically the story on how I became the announcer. He was a good man, a charitable man, the finest entertainer to ever live. I feel proud, I feel it was an honor to have associated with a man with everything he stood for. When he did a charity show, every cent went to charity. Nothing was deducted for expenses. Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. Thank you and good night. Elvis loved animals. He really loved animals and kids. One time in the early 60s, Alan Fortas, there's another animal lover, he worked with us. And he heard about this chimpanzee that was on this TV show and local show in Memphis. Alan said, listen, Mr. Kilbrew has this little baby chimp that he wants to sell. Why don't we get him? So Elvis said, yeah, that's a good idea. So he had it. Mr. Kilbrew brought him out to the Graceland. Cute little chimp. It was gorgeous, a little nice and cuddly. And so Elvis bought him. And Elvis named him Scatter. I don't know where he thought of this idea. Elvis had weird names for animals, Scatter. Every place we go, we take this chimp. So after about a year or so, he decides to take him to Hollywood with us. We take him there. And you know, you just can't take a chimp every place. And we'd have these parties at the house in Bel Air. And there'd be people there and girls and all of us guys sitting around watching, listening to music, playing pool. Elvis would tell Alan, go get Scatter, bring him into the room, bring him into the party. So 
<laughs> I remember Alec come walking in hand in hand, and all of a sudden this chimp is making the loudest screaming noise. Scared the hell out of all the girls and the people in the room. And he comes running in <laughs> and jumps up on Elvis's lap and gives Elvis a big hug. So that was great. All the girls, all how cute and all that, you know. So during the evening, Scatter, he was walking around. But he, we didn't know, and he's going out taking over his drink, and he's drinking it, and he's drinking people's drinks. Little by little, the thing's getting drunk. <laughs> and he's running around. He's looking on the girl's skirts. Uh, it, w it was a pretty wild night. And this went on for a long time. Poor Scatter, we took him to the lot one day. But he would make noise during the takes of the filming, so we had to put him in the dressing room. So Alan put him in the dressing room, did a Goldwyn Studios. We were all on the set, and all of a sudden we get a phone call on the set from Sam Goldwyn's office. It was right above Elvis's dressing room. The chimp got out. They got up the window and went into the window of Sam Goldwyn's office, and it was just scared the secretary. She was throwing papers, she was scared, and all of a sudden we got a call. Security says, come and get this chimp. You have orders to get him off the lot. And so we had to come and get him. Get him. Alan went and got him, and he drove off and took him off in Elvis's Rolls Royce, sitting in the back seat with the, with the chimp and Alan, and took him home. And we couldn't bring him on the sets anymore. And as time went on, you know, he got a little uncontrollable. Chimps are good at a certain age, but then he had to take him back to Memphis and they had to put him in a cage and keep him at Graceland. And the sad thing about it, I think um, we got a call one day and say he died. The kid, the, Scatter died. We, we all figured it was like heartbreak. I mean, he was around people all the time, and all of a sudden he was separated completely, and it was a sad story. And, but uh, I'll never forget those days with that, with that chimp. But I did see him around the base quite often. He'd be uh, doing his work, and uh, I, I never had the nerve to go over and talk to him. I just felt uncomfortable about it, so I just left him alone. While I was there, I became good friends with the, the camp photographer. And he was more or less assigned from the Army to take pictures of Elvis doing his duties and uh, for the Army so they could use Elvis in publicity for get guys to join up. And Wes Daniels, his name was, and he, he asked me one day, he said, Joe, listen, Elvis plays football on the weekends, and we're looking for some more players. You want to play? I said, yeah, I would love to play. So uh, he invited me out that Saturday, went to his house. Elvis had a house off base. Um, went to this little park near his house and went over and he introduced me to Elvis and he said, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. And I said, I'm Joe Esposito. And we chit chat a little while and he said, you're on my team on this game. So we had a nice little touch football game. Uh, there was about 10 guys, five on each side. And after that, he invited me to the house to have a Pepsi, a Coke or something. So we go to the house and that's where I really got to talk to him for a little while, you know, and he asked where I was from and uh, how long I've been in the service. and. So we, we sort of hit it off. Uh, you know, you could tell when you, when you click with somebody, uh, his personality and my personality seemed to hit it off at that time. And after that evening, uh, he said, listen, anytime you want to come over and play football with us or come on and uh, hang out on the weekend, uh, you're welcome to. And that's basically how it started off. And we just uh, hit it off. And weekends, I go hang out with him and uh, play touch football, or he'd sit and play music. And we got to know each other that way. It's strange, you know, I'm sitting here, 1959, with the biggest star in the world. He's playing music at the piano and singing songs, rags to riches, a lot of the oldies but goodies songs, which he loved. And I think, how could this have happened to me? Well, I was so upset because I was drafted in the service at the time, but now I'm sitting here with this gentleman, nice guy, just like another human being, just like one of us, but yet he's the biggest star in the world. It was very exciting. I used to write my letters to my family. They couldn't believe it. They say. You're visiting with Elvis, you're having dinner with him, you're talking to him? I said, yeah. And it, it was exciting. It's, uh, you know, it's something I will never forget. While we're in the service, Elvis read a newspaper article about uh, this guy, Sergeant Hank Slomansky, who was a karate expert. And Elvis read this article about this guy that fought 150 guys in one day in Japan and beat them all. And this was very unusual. I and mean, karate was not too well known at that time. It got Elvis interested into it. And he had Lamar Fike, one of his friends there with him, call, check around if there's any karate instructors in Germany. And he did fine, they found one. Nice German man came over and started teaching Elvis karate. So as, as he was learning this three times a week, he was told there was a real good instructor in Paris, France, uh, Oriental gentleman. And uh, the German karate instructor set it up for us to go there 
and take less Elvis to take lessons from him. So that gave me a chance. Elvis invited me to go to Paris, France with him, which I've never I was never to Paris yet. So it was exciting. So but to go there with Elvis was even more exciting. We get on our train, we get off the train, and there's a big limousine waiting for us. Now here were all these GIs. I think I was a corporal at the time. Elvis uh, was a sergeant. We go out there, and there's a couple of generals walking by us. Naturally, we salute them, and we jump in this big, long limousine, and <laughs> the generals jump in their taxis, <laughs> and they take off. And I said, you know, this is pretty amazing. And uh, that was a hell of an experience, I'll tell you, because walking around with Elvis in Paris, everybody recognized him. We were walking down to Champs-Élysées, people were just coming up to him and talking to him, and he'd sign autographs, and we stayed in a beautiful hotel on the top floor of the penthouse, and I was in heaven. I mean, I'd never stayed in a hotel like this in my life. And he said, just sign for anything you want, just sign for the food, and make sure you tip them. And uh, that was my first uh, leave away from the Army with Elvis. And I think uh, that experience probably ended up leading me to go to work for him. Because before we left for Paris, his father, Vernon, gave me the money. He said, Joe, take charge of the money pay all the bills, make sure you bring back receipts for me. He says, because uh, I need somebody to do that because we never do that for tax purposes. And I came back, I gave his father all the receipts and everything, and accounted for all the money. And I think that sort of led to my employment with Elvis. While we were in Paris, we went to the, the Lido show. And uh, like I say, this is the first time for me to go someplace with a big celebrity. We walk in, naturally, there's a table down front, ringside center, for all of us guys, it was uh, Elvis, uh, Lamar, Cliff Cleaves, myself, and the karate instructor, the German karate instructor. And we're sitting there at the ringside center, and the show goes on. Now, I've never seen a, a show like this before. It's all these beautiful women, all topless, on stage. Well, in America, this never happened, you know. And I'm sitting there with Elvis, and they're dancing, and they're all looking down at the table, because they all knew Elvis was there. And uh, so after the show, it was a great show, they invited Elvis backstage. So we all went backstage and met the, the stars of the show and um, all these beautiful girls were there and Elvis invited a bunch of them to go out and have a drink with us after the show. So that was great. We went to this little private little club in back of the Champs-Élysées there and uh, it was called the Bantu Club. I'll never forget that. It was all entertainment people. And we were sitting there with about 12 gorgeous ladies. I thought I died and went to heaven here. <laughs> this kid from Chicago. And uh, we sat around, dr drank, and the funny thing about it, they were all English. They were girls from England. I thought they'd all be French, but they were English girls. And uh, apparently they, they auditioned and they get in the show. After the show, they had, they had a curfew. The girls had to be back at their quarters by, I think, 1 o'clock in the morning. And then they locked the door. And if they didn't get in, they couldn't get in. I mean, if they couldn't get there before 1, they couldn't get in. The so Elvis invited them all to the hotel. We all hung around the hotel, and they had to stay with us that night, all the girls, because they couldn't get back in. Uh, I won't go any further than that, but it was a great time. It was wonderful <laughs> to be uh, my first experience with Elvis out with a bunch of ladies. It was uh, quite an experience. I think this is a very funny picture. This is a picture of Don Ho and Elvis on stage at the International Hotel. Don was performing there. He invited Elvis up on stage. And Don used to do this routine. He would say, Elvis, kiss me on the cheek. And as Elvis turned to kiss him on the cheek, Don would turn his face towards you. And it looked like they're kissing each other. I stole this picture from the photographer who took the picture, and I kept it all these years. I feel that the impersonators who are impersonating because they are an Elvis fan. The ones that are genuine and they do it because they loved Elvis and they do it to the very best of their ability, it is a compliment. Elvis's fame definitely carried right on over to the impersonators. There's no two ways about it. I watch uh, Elvis documentaries as, as much of the, the early film of Elvis because that's where you'll see the moves. You know, if you can swing your arm and kick your leg out and throw on a jumpsuit, you're an impersonator. But there's just so many out there that can hold a note. When I was little, I just started watching Elvis's movies and I just got started. We all see a little bit of King and all of us, and so these guys all have something to add. So, and the more the merrier, there's plenty of room for everyone. You know what I'm saying? I perform uh, Elvis shows. 
try to keep the memory alive. The main thing is be yourself always. I mean, it's okay when you're on stage to try to mimic him, but don't make a joke of it. Have fun with it, but don't take it too serious. All of us have experienced uh, the same frenzy. I've. It's strange sometimes how your life parallels exactly with Elvis's because you have become him in a sense. You know, in Austria, the people love Elvis, Elvis music, and uh, you can hardly find people who do Elvis impersonating. I've been a homicide detective for the last eight years running our unit in Longview, Texas. I've been a cop for 21 years, and uh, we started doing this about two years ago, and it's a big stress reliever for us, uh, my wife included, uh, and uh, it's a far cry from what I do for a living, and it's fun. You know, I'm having a blast doing this thing. Which one's Elvis? I'm a pretty big fan. I really appreciate what the man has done and how much artistic control he had over a lot of that music he did, and uh, I didn't realize early on how talented he was. Sometimes people really think you're the, you're the man, you know, when I mean, you're up there singing and stuff. Some people just get lost in it, you know. Well, I'm an Elvis impersonator because I love Elvis so much. This is the only way I can give back what he's given to everybody else. I, I just been a fan since uh, I was four years old. I was an MC for karaoke, and uh, I had never sang before in front of a public. And uh, one night nobody would sing, so I said, "Well, I guess I'll have to." The first song I ever sang was "All Shook Up." They danced in the aisles, and I've took off ever since then. I just liked the way he danced and sang, and I just liked to watch him. And when I was little, I watched some of his movies, and I got started, and I started to impersonate him, and I like him a lot. Probably like uh, the most about it is the people that I meet. Yeah, I've been singing since I'm old enough to talk. I've been singing Elvis, nothing but Elvis, you know, from my own choice. It wasn't like I had a parent that said, you know, hey, be like Elvis, you know. To the best of my knowledge, I'm the only homicide cop that impersonates Elvis. I like Elvis' music, and uh, I like to sing the way, and I like his charisma, his way to being like a human being, you know, and, and on stage. Um, I just like all of Elvis. I saw him in person five times. He could have walked out on stage and just stood there for two hours, and everybody would have gone crazy, taking pictures, and he, he wouldn't have even had to sing a note. So I'm an all-state agent during the day, and it gives me some freedom. When I need to get away, I can. And uh, this kind of fulfills the other need, you know, a little bit more of a high-spirited uh, lifestyle. You're in good hands with the king. I've been singing Elvis all my life, you know. Total fanatic since I was a kid. I had the pictures on the wall and everything. And... Well, I get to show my love for Elvis and, and his fans. I'm a little bit surprised because uh, that, that was a dream of mine. When you are young, everybody asks you what you want to be when you grow up. And uh, Elvis make me, make me something, express me so much that I answer, I, I like to be Elvis Presley. The first time I saw him, I broke, broke down and cried when he walked down the stage. If I didn't have fun doing this, I wouldn't be doing it. I got a job, OK? And I, I have no grand illusion that uh, I'm the next Elvis Presley, because there was only one. And that man will never be replaced by anyone. There's a lot of imitators, but that's as close as you get. Is you'll imitate Elvis, but uh, you'll never have the charisma or be able to put into the music the love that he put into it. And I love every minute of it because without Elvis, I wouldn't be here. And without the fans, Elvis wouldn't have been there. I try not to uh, limit myself to one era because I find there's a lot more work and it's a lot more fun if you can do all the eras. He could sing about a carnival and you'd cry. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I can't do the lip thing. Everybody misses what was out there. Everybody is looking for something. And what it is is the music that he had is no longer around, per se. And this is what brings everybody back. I don't care how 20, 30 more years from now, everybody's going to remember Elvis. The toughest thing about impersonating Elvis is, is finding a band that'll play them the same way they were played back then. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Elvis fans come from all corners of the globe. Paul McLeod of Olive Branch, Mississippi, just might be the world's biggest Elvis fan. What do you think of our dedication and everything like that? You don't think it's crazy, do you? 
crazy. Ah, maybe a little touched. <laughs> yeah, my name is Paul B. McLeod. Uh, me and my son, who's named after Elvis, his name's Elvis Aaron Presley McLeod. And what we're doing here, I've been at this for about, uh, going on 42 years now. And uh, we're the ultimate Elvis fans. It's an archive of museum shrine to Elvis. Uh, built out of pure love and devotion. And we're just preserving the memory of Elvis Presley here. Uh, we do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Even Christmas night or New Year's makes no difference to us. People even show up here Christmas, even Christmas night, believe it or not. We can tell you about facts on Elvis by the year, the month, the week, the day, the time, the station, black and white color, closed caption, and if it's been repeated from Mickey Mouse to Donald Duck to Flying Saucers to the President of the United States. But if it ain't pertaining to Elvis, we don't keep it. You read it right there, the universe, the galaxy, the planet, the world's number one ultimate Elvis fans. Now what it is, uh, it's a museum, I'll give you one of our press releases, we're all out of pamphlets, the guy was supposed to get him over here last night and he never showed up, I'm expecting about 50,000 more. Uh, we give charge $5 for an hour and a half tour if it's one person or 350. One group just hit us a while back, Canada 282. If anybody ain't satisfied with the tour we give them here, we just ask them right away. We'll refund back your money. Anybody, ain't nobody asked for no five bucks back around this way. There ain't nothing fanatic about it. What I'm trying to do here, Elvis Presley wasn't born in Russia. He was born down the road here in Tupelo, Mississippi. And uh, so he came from Mississippi, and that's where his roots were from. And I'm trying to preserve a piece of American history is what we're trying to do here. And if I thought that I was disgraced and I was a memory in any kind of way for me and my son, I'd pull the signs out here, I'd close the door, and I'd, you'd probably find me grieve myself to death that I can't change what I'm doing. I wouldn't do it for nothing in the world because this is what makes me happy. Well, I gave up everything I own, I told you, to keep doing this collection and everything. There's not many fans I don't believe worldwide would do with it, but me and my son has dedicated our lives to. What else would you call it? Anybody spends almost uh, 18, 20 hours a day doing this. Yeah, you gotta be dedicated. We're scholars in our own right. A lot of these people don't know what they're talking about. But there's reporters showing up here from all over the world morning, noon, and nighttime. I didn't seek none of it and everything like that. It's just, they just show up and we try to do the best we can to accommodate them. And the Japanese fan club's supposed to be here. They've been here just back the third time. And they cried when they went in here, had tears in their eyes. They got a bronze statue of Elvis over there in Tokyo. And I heard news that they were kind of talking about putting in Elvis City for maybe 60 to 80 million. There was a guy last night here from behind the China wall. I'll show you his card to prove it to you. And he just done a story on us so the people in China at certain parts can get aware of what, you know, uh, Elvis Presley was all about. No, I attended 120 of his concerts and uh, I got close to him eight times. That's the biggest disappointment of my life. I couldn't get near him close enough to shake his hand without the bodyguards fearing that somebody's trying to assassinate him. Like I say, I ain't crazy, and uh, I'd like to live to be 10,000 years, and I'd like to do what Houdini couldn't do, come back on Halloween night. <laughs> yeah. About 10 years ago, I moved to Memphis, and I'd like to be near Grayson, which is directly behind my property. Um, this house also was part of Elvis World, Elvis had purchased this, this house for his friend Gary Pepper, who was the president of Elvis's first fan club, The Tankers, and then Elvis International. Um, Elvis, I think, bought this house for Gary because he wanted his own private sanctuary. And when he would get tired of the bull up at Graceland, everybody wanting something from him, he didn't like to go next door to his father's place because he couldn't stand his stepmother. So he would come here to spend quiet times with Gary. Because of that fact, the psychics tell me that because Elvis spent such good times here, that's the reason he's chosen this house to come back and visit in his spiritual sense. This is a sliding glass door. Uh, when I first moved in here, the glass door was clear, similar to something like this. Um, through about six to eight months after I moved in here, a little spot formed. I thought it was condensation. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and I called two glaziers in, and they said, there's nothing wrong with the door. They don't know where the spot come, you know, is coming from. And then throughout the years, it started to take image and take form, and basically when you look at it, it became the form of Elvis. Well, I couldn't explain how it happened or where it was coming from, so I had a psychic investigation here. Because I'm so receptive, and the house is so receptive, and because Elvis spent so many good times here and good hours here, 
that this became a place you wanted to frequent. And this became a portal to the spiritual plane. And be between 18 and 20 some odd spiritual guides and guardian angels pass through this portal. And because of their passing through the portal, they leave spiritual energy on the door that's crystallized into the shape of Elvis. Well, there's a couple images I see. I see his head here, two eyes here with a cape. Then I also see his face coming in this way with his eyes. Basically, I have a, 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 a picture of Elvis that looks just like it's the same angle. Other people have seen Elvis with his hair, with his sideburns, with his nose singing into a microphone. We basically open the house to the public, allowing the fans to come and visit. Because at this point, the door really took form. And it was something that some of the fans that, that came that I knew would enjoy, you know, especially if they would put their hands on the door, they would feel tingling and feel energy. So I said, well, let's invite the rest of the fans in. Recently, uh, some strange things happened with my bathroom mirror. When I came out of the shower, I saw the word Elvis printed on the mirror. Can you see it? It says, well, E L V. Hmm. Well, the S and the I and the S are missing now. That is us or something. Uh, and then I just saw another one here. It's Elvis written E L V I S. And this is something that's new that's happened recently. Uh, it might have happened before. We just didn't take notice of it. But every day something else happens here so that spirits let you know. They're here and they're in charge.